Uh, we started the business back in 2020 during COVID, and since then have really scaled it to help over a thousand customers break into both buy side and investment banking roles. Whether you're a college student, a current professional, or just someone looking to break into the industry, doesn't matter where you came from, we can help you out. So I think the goal of this panel is to kind of address any questions that you guys have, talk about our personal experiences, and then we can make it pretty interactive from there. Perfect. Yeah, happy to. And then of course, myself, Rohit Morani, we started the business, yes, middle of COVID. I used to be with Battery Ventures and their growth equity team. Did that for a couple of years, went on to an early stage operating business, Source Scrub, joined them as employee number two. Happy to speak about the operating side if, if anyone is evaluating that. Eventually we scaled up. Luckily we sold the business to main cell partners and then eventually Francisco partners got involved. And then of course started this one. Yeah. So I see we have a question already from Carson and he's asking the best way to go about off cycle investment banking recruiting. Carson, you know, that, that depends on whether you're a current college student or whether you're currently a working professional going for off cycle. Uh, let us know if you have a preference, but we can address both questions here. On the college student side, you know, investment banking recruiting has gotten pushed up pretty early. I think nowadays investment banking recruiting for your junior summer starts in your sophomore spring. So if you've missed those application windows already for next summer, 2023, not to worry. And you can certainly network your way into summer spots. You can network your way into full-time spots. I see for Carson in particular, you're a first-year valuation analyst. You already graduated. No worries there. We actually have a ton of coaches on our platform platform who came from like a big four audit background. Maybe they're at a KPMG, maybe they're at a PwC, and they eventually made their way into investment banking and are doing very well in the industry. I think as a general rule of speaking with any kind of investment banking, networking is going to be your best friend. You know, we have a pretty practical approach here and that Rohit can speak to. But if you're not emailing at least a hundred people a week, you know, I think that'd be a good place to start. We have all kinds of ways to kind of scrape emails based on the format, you know, whether they're at Goldman, Morgan Stanley, we know all the email formats first dot last at bank.com. Sometimes it's first initial dot last, et cetera, et cetera. We can release some more information on that. But I would say, you know, it's really important to position all your experiences and advisory work as tangentially touching investment banking. And you want to make sure that all the skills that you have now, you market in a way that's transferable to the role you're applying for. So, you know, if you're doing valuation, that's already a one-to-one kind of parallel with investment banking, right? What do bankers do all day? They make pitch decks, they make valuation models, DCF, MA, comps. So to the extent you can use your experience. Maybe you have investment banking clients you're doing fair market opinions for, et cetera. Try to tie in the role you're going for with the current role you have and bridge the gap there. But you know, one step one, I would say is networking. Talk to as many people as you can. We target emailing a hundred people a week. Maybe you go down that funnel for networking, maybe 20% of people respond. That's 20 email responses. Maybe, you know, 10% of those people want to talk to you. That's still two people you're talking to a week that you weren't to before. So, you know, the goal is volume. And once you get in front of them, it's convincing them that, hey, you are a smart person who's willing to work hard that has done relevant work. And through that way, you know, we know a ton of banks have spots left for laterals and experienced hires. I don't think they can recruit fast enough, though, with the macro conditions changing, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but I think those are kind of the first two steps, networking and positioning your experience is relevant. Yeah, no, I mean, I think he brings up really good points here, right? For those that do know us, he generally brings more of the technical side of the house. And I bring a little bit more kind of, of like calling non-technical, non-traditional, like hunger hustle. When in doubt, right? Especially coming from a diverse background, call it always push volume, really think about the angle of like, okay, like at the end of the day, if we're looking to get in touch with people and if I'm reaching out to 10 people, not hearing back, if I'm reaching out to 50 couple hearing back, if I really push that number up to like a hundred, right? What does that look like? Whether it be alums from school, if there aren't that many alums there, all of a sudden it's like, okay, listen, I'm in New York, San Francisco, LA, what have you call it like in Indiana, right? Like there have to be, or excuse me, the idea is, is that there would be at least few people within this specific geo, within the specific niche that you're targeting. If there are 10 people within that said industry, within your specific location, call it ping all 10 of them for coffee, right? At the end of the day, see if you can get in touch with as many as possible from that total pool. And then of course, it comes down to your story and positioning, which Asif spoke to. So Carson, you know, thanks for that question. If there's any follow-ups, definitely feel free to keep asking. I see another question here from Tim. He uh, is wondering about off-cycle growth equity recruiting and that, you know, during on-cycle, it was a lot of LBO tests, but, you know, for growth equity, is there any other different kind of technical tests like revenue bill? or cap tables? And then, you know, what's the best way to pitch a sector? Tim, that's a great question. For growth equity, whether it's on cycle or off cycle, I think it's important to define what it is, and then we can optimize for the test. In terms of what is growth equity, it's any investing in any kind of company at an inflection point that may or may not need your capital, but can use it to accelerate their growth, whether that's by adding product lines, entering new geographies, hiring more employees, et cetera, et cetera. And so then you have to distinguish if that's what a growth equity company is, you know, you have a buyout section of growth and you have a minority 
investment section of growth. So when I think about buyout growth equity firms, I think about like TA Associates, for example. They're notoriously called a growth equity firm, but they're always doing over 51% control investments in their companies. And they're also adding leverage. Compare that with other growth equity firms that may or may not employ that strategy. I think maybe an Insight Partners or a General Atlantic come to mind. Really, it's kind of flexible what the definition of growth is. But on the flip side of a TA Associates, you'd have people who are investing less than 50%, maybe call it anywhere from 15 to 30%. They might be leading the round along with other investors who they bring into the deal. And then you know they won't have control. They won't influence day-to-day decisions, but they'll might have a board seat or two that can influence management on a quarterly basis. So I think that distinction is important. Secondly, when it comes to preparing, if you're going for more of the growth buyout shops like TA Associates, maybe even a TCV, for example, who does both majority and minority, they will still give you LBO tests and you will still have to know how to, you know, kind of build in the debt schedule of senior debt, subordinated debt, mezzanine debt, et cetera, just to show that mechanically you have done the necessary preparation to show what it takes to be a private equity associate, even though it is growth equity. And then, you know, a lot of growth coaches will tell us, you know, we don't really do LBOs, but we still give them out as tests just to see if people can do them. You know, if you're an investment banking analyst already, that should be a core competency of yours. And so let's just see how good you are at it. Uh, The good news is with LBOs, it really is an input output situation where if you put in a prerequisite number of hours, anywhere from let's call it 10 to 50 hours of prep, anyone can do an LBO if you're coming from a finance background. Second, on the kind of non-traditional LBO modeling test, definitely we've seen a ton of revenue builds, a ton of cap table exercises. You know, they might point to a market, I don't know, name a random market. They could call it software as a service and just say, hey, if we're kind of selling, I don't know, Rohit, what do you think? Payment processing, Stripe, you know, what are Stripe's revenue streams? And then you might say, okay, there's payment processing as part of the revenue build. There's probably have some direct to consumer revenue. They probably have some B2B revenue. You'd kind of go down through all the components of revenue until you get to that full line item of what is revenue versus for a standard LBO test, you'd probably start with revenue and then work down all the costs, you know, COGS, SGNA, and all that interest and tax expense and get down to cash flow, which is extremely important for LBOs because you need all that cash flow to pay down debt. Now, if your company doesn't generate any cash, maybe it's an early stage or growing company and it's just like burning millions of dollars a year, obviously an LBO is probably not feasible unless you're raising money against ARR, which sometimes we've seen some lenders provide one to two turns of leverage on annual recurring revenue because the contracts are so locked in and maybe you have some degree of visibility on cash coming in. But no, I think that's the distinction. And coming up with a prospective investment idea or sector is very important. We have a phenomenal guide that was built by former bankers from Catalyst or Lazar Tech Groups and who are now in you know, VCs and growth equity funds, I would highly recommend taking a look at. Yeah. I mean, I think to that point itself, what we have found, some of our mentees have actually followed up with calling investors after like first round interviews, call it like uh, even like cold outreach, right? Being like saw that you did like the series D within like loop business. Now these were like pros and cons that basically like understanding and giving the investor in your email and understanding of what you thought about when it came to doing that, bit when it came to pursuing that business and your investment thesis, right? So it's like saw that you led series D within this business. This is what I would think of when looking at this business model as a whole, right? These are the pros, these are the cons. Did you think about like market dynamics here? Did you think about like market tailwinds here? Just so you get an understanding to that other individual in a short, concise note that's like, hey, listen, like I'm thinking in the or with the mindset of an investor, right? Because from coming from the banking side of things, coming from the advisory side, generally ends up being a bit more high level. If you can actually show that diligence being like, okay, I know that you sit on the board of this company. I know that you're a board observer or member. And these are my thoughts specifically on this thesis. These are my thoughts specifically on this portfolio company. And hopefully, hopefully the idea is that that catalyzes some sort of response from this other individual on the other end. You really want to grab their attention, ask for coffee, hop on the phone, whatever it may be, being like, okay, listen, compared to the average individual these days that reaches out, being like, hope all is well. Do you have a couple minutes to chat? You're really taking it to another level. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Rohit and I, we actually have an office hours mentee that we have in our phones as cold email king. And this man is a you know second year analyst at a bulge bracket tech bank, faced a lot of uphill battles getting into certain processes just because of you know his, his background in undergraduate and also an international angle. So he really had to step up and differentiate himself from his peers. And so, you know, we always recommend provide value from the first interaction. Like anyone can send a, hey, I'm an alum from your school or I used to work at your bank. Do you have any advice on prep? Do you have a few minutes to chat? I think that's a good level one email, but a level two email is immediately adding value. And the best way to add value is to maybe kind of do the job you're applying for. And so for him as a cold email king, he would send one to five page investment memos on a sector or a company of choice that was relevant to the portfolio. And through this, he was able to get phone calls calls with investors at Insight Partners, Toma Bravo. He was able to get in front of, I think, probably 10 to 15 funds by directly emailing people. And the next question you might ask is, hey, who do I email this? 
Uh, we think VP plus is probably a good idea. We think analysts and associates might be good to get intel about the firm, but the VP plus people actually have the authority to bring you into interview. And so this particular individual, uh, you know, kudos to him. He was interviewing the heads of all of these firms and, and getting responses and getting coffee. So he really impressed them. We can talk about structuring an investment thesis too. Again, we have guides for that on office hours, but you know, ha- happy to answer any specifics there either. Definitely back that statement around uh, pinging VPs. Honestly, I had a conversation today with the mentee who was saying he connected with an analyst, who honestly pushed him onto another analyst. The analyst was effectively like, what is this conversation about? Like, what are we chatting about? Honestly, it was rather rude if you really were to ask me. Not exactly the best depiction of a firm that to a bulge bracket because he was looking to lateral. Now, long story short, generally, generally what we find is that if analysts and associates generally end up being kind of like bottom of the totem pole, end up being swamped with work, necessarily they aren't thinking about it from like a long-term and longevity perspective of staying at the firm. Versus VPs, you're generally managing up and you're managing down to your analysts and associates, as well as of course, to your directors and MDs being like, okay, listen, I want to eventually be like you in your position one day. And if you're a VP, you really, I mean, these days we have associates even trying to transition to the buy side, post MBA associates, which is generally supposed to be a little bit more career track. VP is definitely a bit more career track, right? So if you think about it from that perspective, and we've connected with VPs from elite boutiques amongst other shops, and they're like, we're looking for talent, right? Frankly, if I bring in talent, that makes me look better. So from that perspective, hungry, hungry VPs will be open to hopping on the phone, likely that they have a little bit more time, right? So then from that perspective, they're focused on recruiting and it is like team building and culture is technically one of their like core responsibilities. So we generally find reaching out to VPs ends up being more fruitful. Also think about their incentive structure. Sometimes they pay headhunters like a third of your all-in compensation for private equity jobs uh, to to place someone. So if a private equity associate is making $300,000, the firm has to pay an extra $100,000. So a third of 300,000 to a recruiting firm to place them. If you can just go through a VP and uh, the VP can hire good talent that does a great job, you can save the firm a hundred grand. It makes the VP look really good. So they're incentivized to find talent as a, as a core function. Second of all, on the investment banking front, I just talked to an analyst the other day who said, hey, anyone we refer to our group that gets hired, we get a $15,000 bonus, referral bonus. I think 15,000 is a little high. You know, Typically it's a couple of thousand dollars, but there are financial incentives for people to refer others. So if you can stand out as a, hey, this is a no brainer type hire. They've done all the work. I trust them in front of you know my associates, my VPs, my managing directors to interview. They will bring you in. So the key is to get in front of them and then prove your worth. No, I think that brings up a good point. Honestly, Asif, because you have experience on the back end, mind if you chat a little bit about on-cycle recruiting and how that's changed over the last couple of years? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And just give us a shout in the chats or comments if private equity, growth equity, or investment banking is more relevant to you. And again, we can cover all of the above. But in terms of how private equity recruiting works, it's divided between on-cycle and off-cycle. And on-cycle really occurs. So say that you know, you're know you an undergraduate program, four years, you do a junior year summer internship at an investment bank and you return full time. So say, you know, you're graduating in 2023, uh, you graduate around May or June, you probably have some, you know, six weeks to 10 weeks of training at your bank in August, usually headhunters will start reaching out to you in August. So you might still be in training, you might not have hit the desk full time yet. And these 10 to 15 headhunters that kind of are the gatekeepers of private equity will email you saying, hey, fill out this profile, let's have a 30 minute chat, whether in person or, you know, with COVID over Zoom. And it's basically a first round interview. They'll ask you to walk you through your resume. They'll ask you what types of funds are you targeting, what types of geographies, what types of sectors. And you know they might ask you some basic technical questions or ask you about your deal experience, which is kind of tough if you are if you haven't even hit the desk yet. But then they'll kind of keep you on the back burner until what we call like on-cycle recruiting kicks off. And that's when the private equity firms actually start interviewing folks. And historically, that's been in September of your first year. So say you hit the desk in August, one and a half, two months later, you're already interviewing for a job that won't start for another two years. So if you're graduating summer 2023, you hit the desk in August, September, 2023, you might be interviewing for a job that starts in 2025. So it's pretty accelerated. You don't have a lot of time to kind of figure things out in prep, which is why we always recommend starting early. A lot of people we work with are seniors in college um, who have already kind of gone through our LBO training and are starting the case prep already. COVID has kind of shifted the timeline back a little bit, and but we do think it's normalizing. So for the class of 2020, their recruiting occurred in September, 2021. So one full year after they started instead of, you know, two months. Uh, But for the class of 2021, who are starting jobs next summer in 23, they just had the recruiting in March. I believe they kicked off March 29th and just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. So all that's to say is it'll happen sooner than you think. It'll happen when you're least expecting it. And so it's probably best to get prepared as soon as possible. Now, how do you get prepared? Private equity interviews more or less will ask the same content to varying degrees. They're going to ask you about three major things. 
One is the LBO model, which we talked about. You know, if you spend enough hours, you can figure out how to do an LBO model. Just look at the right materials and do as many models as you can. That LBO model might be from a template. It might be two or three statement. It might be completely a blank Excel sheet. And they give you like a PDF version of an income statement and a balance sheet. And they give you three hours to say, hey, like model this full three statement LBO model with a blank Excel and talk about five bullet points about questions you might ask about assumptions. So those types of blank Excel, like pressure tests are usually done by the mega fund. So I'm talking about a TPG. I'm talking about a Blackstone. Uh, whereas the more like downstream you go, upper middle market, middle market, you're not going to be involved in necessarily highly complex, take private LBOs. You might be doing like a pretty steady eddy business that has like, you know, 20 to 100 million EBITDA. You just slap an EBITDA multiple on there and make a quick two statement financial model. So the funds LBO test will be indicative of the type of LBOs the fund does. So the larger upstream you go, the more complex the transactions are, the harder the LBO test will probably be. That being said, these days, LBOs are a check the box item. I think most people are expected to pass the LBO, though, if you ask our coaches, I think some firms, even some mega funds who are interviewing stellar candidates from, you know, bulge brackets from like undergraduate business schools, I think they still have like a 30% pass rate on the LBOs, which is disappointing compared to last year's. But I think that's a mark to really stand out if you have your LBO perfect. But all that's to say LBOs are one bucket of private equity interviews. The second bucket are deal walkthroughs. And so these are about the deals you do while in banking or transaction advisory in some cases. And they're just basically going to ask end to end, what was your role on the deal? So, you know, what was the transaction? You know, this acquirer acquiring this target, how much was the transaction value? What are some high level multiples and financials? And let's talk about the investment merits and considerations. A lot of investment bankers, their job is to, you know, make a company look as pretty as possible ahead of a sale process. And that way they can maximize the enterprise value. And since bankers get paid a percentage, usually of the enterprise value, you know, they get paid more. So they're incentivized to make the company look as good as possible. The job of an investor who is actually buying that company and holding it for the next five to seven years, which is a typical private equity hold period, is to screen past the BS and say, hey, what are the investment merits of this company? But what are the considerations? What are some like risk factors that we have to get comfortable against in order to mitigate this risk and ensure that we can earn our LPs, our required return? And for most private equity funds, they'll target a 20% IRR. So you know, 20% IRR basically means what is your annual return rate for over the five to seven year hold period? That means you earn 20% per year over five to seven years, which is really hard to do. I think the S&P is like returning eight to 10% a year on average, depending on where you start, you know, post 80s, pre 80s, it depends. But, you know, getting 20% return and, you know, some funds are getting 30% plus returns is extremely difficult. And we think private equity is a pretty good return profile compared to other alternative asset classes like venture capital, which I think has a lower average return and also hedge funds, which can have extremely high returns, but on average are lower than private equity just because so many of them go bust because it's a riskier strategy. So I've mentioned LBOs as the first bucket and deal walkthroughs as the second. The third bucket are case studies, which may be relevant to your question, Tim. So case studies can be broken down into either written case studies or verbal case studies. A written case study will be a similar investment recommendation. They might give you a company, you know, 10K or other financials like a SIM or an abbreviated SIM. And they'll say, hey, you have like 30 minutes to read through this document and come up with a list of investment merits considerations. And by the way, why don't you make a quick LBO model while you're at it? So 30 minutes, one hour, it'll be pretty quick and they might watch you build it live. That's one form of written case study. Another written case study is, hey, like it's a take-home case study. You might have two or three days to do it. But you know, if they give you a take-home case study, study, the work product is expected to be significantly of higher quality than when you're doing live over an hour or two. And those case studies will involve financial modeling. So you need to do the LBO. You'll need to run an LBO on the financials they give you. But then you'll also have to have qualitative measures of investment merits and consideration. So, you know, is this company in a growing market? You know, how's the competition? Is there any customer or vendor concentration? Are there any defensible moats to this business? Is this company compete on price or margin? What are the margin expansion opportunities? What are some other valuation cre creation opportunities? So there's this framework framework that investors use. And I think it's pretty similar across all private equity firms. And we've kind of tried to summarize that in our guides on office hours, just as a quick one sheet, two sheet summary, and then you can go practice. But you know, practice makes perfect here. So wherever you do the case studies, you know, whether it's with investor friends you have, or you know, through our platform, it's just important to get the reps in. And a lot of bankers will also ask their peers to run case studies with them. I think that's a good initial first step. But the level of knowledge you gain after being an investor is like, you know, night and day compared to a banker. Like we said, the banking trade training is to package companies to look as nice as possible. The investor training is to take a more pessimistic view and ask what could go wrong and how do we mitigate against it? So really important you get the reps in. So that's the written case study. And then the verbal case study I'll say is more of a qualitative exercise. They might just say any random company and ask you to think about whether it's a good investment or not. So it's almost like a business intuition slash business IQ test where, you know, 
you can study frameworks about good business models. It does show that how often do you think about revenue models and cost structures? But you know, one question might be, hey, like I was shopping at Whole Foods the other day, decided to go into the brick and mortar store today. Let's talk about Whole Foods revenue model. What do you think it is? How do you think Whole Foods makes money? And you know, you might say, okay, Whole Foods, they sell a lot of groceries. So their revenue model is probably, you know, average price times quantity sold. It's a price times quantity model that equals revenue. And we'll say, okay, great. You know, can you break that down further? And you might say, you know, Whole Foods kind of sells brick and mortar versus online. And, you know, the, in, the interviewer might say, that's awesome. You know, what do you think is a higher margin, the online business or the brick and mortar retail? And, you know, you'd walk down the cost and you'd say, okay, you know, for online, you know, there's probably less distribution costs because you don't have that overhead versus the brick and mortar. You know, you have all these people that you have to pay all this rent expense you have to pay. So, you know, maybe the online delivery service is a little bit higher margin. And the interviewer might come back and say, hey, you know what? That's fair. I like how you're thinking. But at the end of the day, they're still picking up all the foods from Whole Foods, you know, brick and mortar. They're still paying people to do it. And by the way, they're spending more marketing dollars on the online distribution platform. And so it's actually a lower margin item. What do you think about that? And so it's going to be a back and forth debate and conversation about the business model that I think, you know, having a lot of reps in and using our business intuition guide, especially is super helpful for. So those are the three major buckets, LBOs, deal walkthroughs, case studies. Um, I think after that, if you have the behavioral questions down, you can probably secure a PE offer. And then it's a matter of picking which fund you want to work at and kind of backing into telling the headhunters, hey, given my experience, I'm a good fit for a tech buyout fund, or hey, I really deserve to be at a consumer buyout or growth fund like El Catterton, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe Rohit, we can talk about, you know, how do you decide what fund to work at? Yeah. No, in all honesty, I think that's a really big part of the process that a lot of people don't tend to focus on in the beginning. And then they kind of leave it to later, right? If you think like, honestly, even when I have conversations with individuals, when we're evaluating to bring them on as mentees or not, it's like sick discussion. If someone says that they want to work at a mega fund, Apollo, Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, TPG, you get offers at all of them. Which one do you take and why? Most of the time, individuals actually don't really have a succinct answer of why they want to work at, even if you said like Apollo, Blackstone, Carlisle, right? Give me an understanding of like, what specific thesis are you a fan of? What specific fund are you a fan of? What specific firm and why, right? Have you connected with individuals from the teams? Have you gotten an understanding of like a favorite portfolio company, least favorite portfolio company, what they've like really pursued from a strategy perspective, the homework, right? With headhunters, we tend to hear quite a bit. I'm open to any major fund that's out there that has over a billion, call it in current fund size, call like a few billion AUM, call like mid-market, upper middle market, or even larger than that, or a fund that has like a strong consumer practice. So what I'm really getting at is generally as much research as you can about this firm team, the culture, if you can really figure that out from online presence, right? Whether it be Twitter, whether it be websites, whether it be YouTube, whether it be any sort of press releases, blog posts, more and more firms have started increasing their digital presence to really start differentiating themselves from others that are out there within this private equity landscape, right? If you think that they're like, call like roughly like 300 major, like private equity, growth equity firms, the idea is like, how do you sift through them to figure out what's really a good fit for you? Now, I hear this quite a bit. I see, correct me if I'm wrong, but like people are like, okay, so technically I thought like headhunters ran the process for buy side recruiting. Like, why would I need to network? Why do I need to reach out to people and learn more about them? I thought that was more like a banking thing to network, to break in. Yeah. You know, a lot of people thought that in the past. I myself thought this a year or two ago, but the reality is the headhunters, again, their job is just to get the roles filled. So let's say New Mountain Capital is hiring four associates this year. The headhunters don't really care who those four associates are. They just need those four spots filled as soon as possible, and then they get paid. So when you think about that, and especially if you're a non-traditional candidate, it's very easy to fall through the cracks because why would anyone give you a chance or take a risk on you? So a headhunter's job often just becomes, hey, like who had a 3.9, who went to a Target slash Ivy League school? School, who's working at a top five bank, you know, who's working into these feeder groups, let's just take all those resumes and give them to the funds. And by the time they do that, and the funds interview people and funds, by the way, don't have all day to interview people. Recruiting is like a full time process. That's why people dedicate a week or so to it. They take the entire deal team away from their day jobs, which is, you know, doing deals and they have them interview people because you have to meet people from the associate to the VP to the partner levels before you get the offer. Private equity firms are incredibly lean and it's very important that you get along with everyone. So they do put you in front of very varying levels of people. So, you know, they do it very quickly. So maybe they interview 20 to 50 candidates during on cycle. What is going to make you one of the 20 to 50 candidates if you're not a direct connection to that fund or, you know, some alumni from that school or bank? And even then, I guarantee you there's more than 50 people who check those boxes. So how do you stand out? You have to take control. You have to put your destiny into your own hands. And the best way to do that is by proactively doing outreach and forming a relationship with people who have the power to give you jobs. And those people sometimes might not be the headhunters. Again, you know, they're, they have a full-time job. They have plenty of resumes coming to them, especially if you're a non-traditional candidate. Networking is your best bet here. I couldn't agree more. Honestly, 
whether it be traditional or non-traditional, really getting an understanding directly from that individual around why they like this firm, what they thought about when they were choosing the firm. And in all honesty, if you actually kind of like break the ice with them and really have like a full candid or full candor like conversation, you could potentially even get kind of like pros and cons, right? No one's ever going to say that like, oh yes, like working in private equity at the specific firm is my dream, right? There, there are pros and cons to every role that are that is out there. So if you really do have that conversation a bit more openly, you can get a better understanding of like, okay, listen, like at TA, we're really big fans of people, right? Culture is phenomenal. Now at the same time, of course, technically it is like sourcing, eat what you kill a little bit. Does it get internally competitive? Of course, right? You have like a massive associate class. How could it not? Not everyone's going to come back as a VP. That just wouldn't make sense. So pros and cons to everything, right? Like really, really diving deep into getting to know a firm through its people, going in and having like a portfolio company in mind that you really liked. If it's like a Discover Org, a Zoom Info that TA's done really well with, it's like, wow, like how do you see that business still growing? Like I think they just announced like 49% year over, or excuse me, quarter over quarter, which is phenomenal for, for behemoth that size, right? And that was like one of like TA's best deals ever. You could just run Google searches and find this information. So then the idea is like, who can you get in touch with to learn more about that? And then through that, get in touch with the people. Now I get to know the people. The other side of it is if you're interacting with individuals and they're just rude to you, they don't respond or they do respond with the, oh, honestly, like, what is this about? Like, I don't really have the time to chat. Do you really want to work there? At the same time, what I would respond to that is people want to talk to those who have done their homework. And again, you know, don't go in blind. Don't just do everything you can to get in front of them and then ask, hey, you know, what is TA Associates? You know, what fund are you on? How much AUM do you have? What's your strategy? Like, I would say those are not great questions to ask because you can Google all of this and their website has tons and tons of pages on it. We know because we know we just did it ourselves and made, you know, did an assessment of, you know, what firms and what banks do PE firms hire from? And you'd be surprised, you know, it's not all bulge brackets. There's a ton of middle market banks. There were some banks on there that I'd never heard of that plays into these like stellar, stellar funds. So I think everyone has a shot, but you know, I think a lot of the problem is a lot of people don't know enough about the industry to ask good questions and they don't know where to go to like find out more. Cause a lot of people might still be asking, Hey, what is growth equity versus buyout? And you know, for a private equity associate, that might be a tough question to like, you know, if you're on a live deal to spend 30 minutes a day to get off the phone and like answer the basic questions like that, which is why if you can figure that kind of low hanging fruit stuff out yourself, and then you get in front of them and say, Hey, like zoom info. I saw that was one of TA's best deals of all time. You guys made, you know, over 20 X on it. Like, how did you do that? Uh, or were you involved with the deal process? You know, that's a lot more personalized and interesting question for that associate to talk about. Uh, so, you know, doing your homework is extremely important. Yes. By the way, if anyone has any questions and wants to kind of, I, I, I don't know, really, can we pull them up on the, on the panel to ask verbal questions? We're happy to chat with you uh, up on the stage. I'm happy to give you personalized advice, you know, whether that's um, breaking into banking from advisory or growth equity cases or whatever, feel free to raise your hand or ask in the chat. We can pull you up here. Yeah. Uh, but sorry, what were you saying, Rod? No, sorry. So in all honesty, yes, I guess sometimes you do tend to underestimate kind of like quality of questions as a whole. It is very important to do the homework on the back end, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff comes naturally to us just because we've been doing it for so long, but definitely the research as a whole. And I mean, to a certain degree, right? I mean, I look at that as like videos. I look at that as like reading the website. I look at that as looking at portfolio companies, LinkedIn, right? I, we even have like our team put LinkedIn's directly into calendar invites. And thank you for that. But it's huge, right? Just to get an understanding of like where someone may have gone to school, what they did from a background perspective, what they're doing today, you going in and having more of this information, literally as your arsenal, call it kind of in your tool belt type of situation to go in really armed in a conversation will only help you, right? Because then it's like, hey, listen, like I know that you've already done like X, Y, Z. I really wanted to specifically pinpoint like, hey, listen, like I understand the whole concept, non-target to where you are today. The reality is like, if you had to do it again, would you go directly to this firm, right? If you're deciding between like a GS and MS, what made you choose bulge bracket over elite boutique, right? Stuff that you can't necessarily grab from the internet, stuff that you really have to like dive deep into. And the person's like, okay, you know what? Like this person did a little bit of homework. Even if it was like one, 2% homework, I'll carry them 90, 95, 98% of the way there. But it's like, okay, you give me something to run with. People love having conversations and explaining what they've done themselves. You just have to enable that. Yeah. You're definitely not expected to know everything going in, but you know, showing that you're curious, thoughtful, you've done what you can on your end and are coming in kind of prepared goes a long way because they're going to look for those same traits when you're on the job. You're not expected to know everything about every investment or every kind of financial line item. But it, you know, you do have to demonstrate that, hey, I've done as much as I can by myself. I've gone to Google. I've used the resources we have. I've come up with a list of 10 to 20 questions and here they are. Instead of, you know, every five minutes slacking someone or asking them, you know, your VP, oh, where is like the LBO template? I know we have to do this for the sim or, oh, where's the market analysis kind of template slide? You go to him 10 minutes later, then 20 minutes later, you say, oh, by the way, you know, is there any specific format that the write-up is supposed to be in? It's going to get extremely annoying. So showing that, hey, you've done the research, you've sat there, you've thought about it, and then you go to them thoughtfully, simulate the same thing on a phone call. 
people. Like I've read your entire website. I've read all your press releases or recent ones. I have a view on like one or two portfolio companies. I've looked at you specifically, your LinkedIn. I've saw where you've gone to school, where you've interned, what group you're in, maybe what portfolio companies are listed. I have a view on them. I want to ask you questions on them. That's a great, that's a great place to start. Nice. If we don't have any other uh, specific questions here, I see mind explaining a little bit more. We've had the conversation quite a bit around switching industries, really getting an understanding from whether it be from a coverage group, one to the other, or just in general, having that conversation from more generalist to specifically focused or call it from like a specific focus to another specific focus. Yeah. I would say there are certain industries where the valuation framework you learn is textbook and can be applied to other industries. I would say those industries are like industrials where you're making widgets. It doesn't really matter what widget you're making them. They cost a certain amount. And you sell them for a certain amount. So that's your gross margin profile. And then you have, you know, operational factories, warehouses, distribution, or whatever that all go to SGNA and some split into cogs, of course, but you know, a lot of that SGNA is pretty manageable. You might end up with like a 10 to 20, 25% margin business. Business makes sense. It's cash flowing, it's growing, you know, single digits, maybe low teens. If you learn how to value businesses like that, they're just buying and selling products in industrials. You can apply that same framework to a consumer company. Consumer companies are doing the same thing, right? They're just making something using all these raw materials and inputs and then getting them sold. You know, like they don't have to be widgets. They might be toys. They might be fidget spinners. They might be, you know, Apple watches, but it's the same business model. And then you have more esoteric industries, industries in which the valuation methodologies might not be applicable to others. Those that come to mind immediately are like FIG, financial institutions group, where your business is to value banks, asset managers, you know, banks, they don't, their revenue and their costs are very different, right? They look at the amount of customer deposits they have, and they look at the liabilities on what they have to give back to people, what they owe to people. That kind of modeling is very rigorous, but doesn't really apply to normal businesses. So if you're coming from a normal business into that niche group, it might be difficult. Same thing with tech. A lot of tech businesses these days, they don't have any cash flow. And for that reason, you can't do a DCF on a business with no cash flow, unless you're projecting out many years in the, in the future, or you know they're close to break even, and you have some sense of what they're going to cash flow. But if they've been burning like hundreds of millions of dollars and have no path to profitability in the near term, you can't run a DCF, you can't run an LBO, it's just very challenging. And so instead of focusing on that cash flow line, which is after all costs, you focus on the revenue line. And when you look at the revenue line, tech businesses have specific contracts where for a SaaS business, they might have annual contracts, they might have monthly contracts, and these contracts collect some cash up front, and then the customer's on the hook to pay that over time, no matter what happens. And if they don't, you know, the SaaS company can back can come back and sue them or like hold them in, in credit court or whatever it is, you know, that the same thing that would happen if you don't pay your credit card bill, for example. And so you, know, you have to learn more revenue modeling. And that's why you have to learn more about market sizing and mapping and all that good stuff for tech companies. If you want to make a switch from a traditional business to an esoteric business, so maybe an industrials like I did into tech, like I did, it's going to be an uphill battle because you're going to be facing all these people who did tech investment banking or worked in technology focused groups who have relevant deals on their experience. And you're going to be finding to go to a fund where they do the same line of work and you're going to have to convince people why you as an industrials banker can outcompete the other people who have two, three years of experience ahead of you. So it's not easy. You can do it. You just have to show a lot of interest. You have to do your research. For me, I like went and did three case studies by myself. I just read like the 10 Ks for Google, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, and just like got my head around what they actually do. I got my head around, you know, SaaS metrics. Um, I'd made the models myself. And then by the time I was able to get in front of people, I had no questions on my ability to do the work because I had done it already. And that's what Office Hours kind of tries to simulate. But, you know, getting in front of them is also very challenging because every single headhunter asked me, you know, why should we talk to you? We have all these tech bankers from Morgan Stanley interviewing at these jobs. You're doing industrials at Wells uh, or, you know, doing private equity at an industrials firm. Why should we hire you for a, for a growth equity or tech buyout fund? And so, you know, I also did what we talked about earlier. I went directly to the funds and I said, hey, like I follow these, these, and these people. These are my thoughts on these companies. And this is my thoughts on your investments. Can we hop on the phone? And that proved to be a pretty successful strategy. So if you're trying to switch industries, it's definitely difficult. You're going to have to do some legwork, but it's not impossible. Awesome. Uh, we have another question here. How would you recommend someone break into New York private equity from Canada? I was wondering if you've seen it done before without having a banking internship or full-time job in New York, but having a full-time banking job in Canada. I could start off here briefly. So I think what's interesting is that, of course, we're going to bring it back to the networking angle and really trying to get in touch with people. Sometimes if that means like hopping on a plane, going out to New York, setting up coffee meetings in advance, setting up lunches, just trying to get in front of people to really have that angle of, hey, hope all is well, wanted to learn more. This is why I'm interested. This is why I'm a fan of what you guys do. So aside from that, the question ends up being in my mind, have you looked into like Canadian firms, like an Onyx, like an Omers, like a Brookfield that technically have New York offices, technically going in the Canadian route, if that was potentially a thought. And I'm not sure, Devon, if you want to speak 
speak, but I can give you permission here. And then just to restate his question, you know, no banking internship or full time in New York, but has a full time banking job in Canada. So I think, you know, and feel free to chime in here, Devon. But first question people will ask you is any visa issues? No worries, no worries. So first question they're going to ask is, do you have any visa issues? And if you're going for a private equity firms, that is often a gating factor until you pass the H1B lottery system, for example. If you don't have any visa issues, great. I think you're eligible definitely to work. They're just going to want to make sure you can, you know, really relocate to New York and that you're part of the best candidate pool and you're competing with all these other people who are also in New York. And so look at what their advantages are and then see how you can overcome them. So being in New York, what advantage do you have? You have the credibility of doing investment banking in New York. But you know, what does that mean? A lot of people, there's only so many deals going around. There's a lot of analysts that don't have closed deals on their resume. There's some that have four or five. So if you could compete with them on deal experience, you're already ahead of the curve and you can kind of assuage questions about, okay, like, were you at a legit place? Were you actually doing a lot of deals? We don't really know about your Canadian experience versus the New York people. So just because they don't know who you are or what you do in Canada because their primary market is New York, you know, shouldn't hold you back. You can make up for that with great experience and networking. And then, you know, secondly, again, if you're at like a Canadian bank that has New York offices, maybe you're at RBC, you know, maybe you're at CIBC. I think internal transfers are pretty common. A lot of our friends, I think we have from Canada who also did like oil and gas kind of banking at Goldman in Canada have made moves over to New York. So it's definitely possible. I think you just have to be a little more deliberate about it. And maybe you couldn't apply to the New York opportunities directly from a Canadian undergraduate school. Like, you know, we have friends from uh, Richard Ivey. We have friends from like Toronto and, and all those kinds of commerce schools and whatnot. And they said they found it extremely challenging to be in New York directly out of undergrad, but they did the full-time banking in Canada. They did a good job. They got good deal experience. They made sure they knew their stuff and then they networked their way into New York firms. So number one, you know, credibility and legitimacy, you can overcome with networking and deal experience. Number two, the advantage New York people have over you is they're in the city so they can meet up for people for coffees casually. In an age of COVID or remote work, that's kind of mitigated. You can have the same Zoom chat that other people in New York are doing while they're networking. At the same time, one of our interns was Boston-based. And before he signed with this current bulge bracket bank, uh, he was uncertain of where to go. And we actually recommended he hop on a train from Boston. He got like a cheap student ticket on the Amtrak. It was like a four-hour journey hopped on the ticket for less than $100, went to New York and just like went with a folder full of resumes and, and went to certain banks where he had maybe one contact and then was able to transform that one coffee conversation to, hey, you know, that combo went really well. Are any of your other analysts in office and could I meet that? And it turned into a full-blown meeting where he met like seven or eight people that one day off that one train ride that ended up getting a full-time offer there coming out of undergrad. So it's definitely possible. You just have to hustle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, you can't stress this enough, right? Like part of it is, of course, like I look at it almost like three tears in a way. Part of it ends up being like when figuring out the industry as a whole, it comes down to like different doors, right? A lot of the times we tend to think like, all right, like which door are we targeting? Which bank do I want to work at? Or is it banking, sales and trading, wealth management, what have you, right? Part of it is like foot in the door. And then part of it is what you do like once you get into the room, right? So sometimes it ends up being like, all right, bro, like I had like firms recruiting at school. So all of a sudden, like I had the path to get in and get my foot in the door. I wasn't necessarily prepared once I got in the room. Some individuals get to be super, super prepared when it comes to like, all right, I know exactly what to say. I just need the interview, right? So it's like, all right, like now you have to figure out like, frankly, which door it is and how to get your foot in there. Now, breaking down the door, right? Like really, really the cold outreach approach works. And anyone says that it doesn't, you should really ask and question kind of like how much volume that they've been pushing. Now, part of our platform and part of office hours honestly helps you out. Like when you get into the room, like really, really focused on being like the smartest, if not like one of the most prepared individuals in the room, because you've been really emulating a lot of those mock environments. Now, of course, part of it ends up being like growth. Like I'm coming from like Canadian background outside of the States, in the States, looking to break into London, looking to move down to Miami for private equity, growth equity, Toma Bravo, what have you. Sometimes you just have to take a bet on yourself and hop on the bus, hop on the train, hop on the plane. Be like, all right, listen, like if I'm like literally like thinking that like this could happen, I'm going to set up a week of meetings in Miami. I'm going to set up a week of meetings at banks in LA because that's where I want to be and just grab coffee with these people. Set up those meetings beforehand, right? But you can orchestrate it take a week off work, work out of another office, what have you, just get out there and meet with people. Face-to-face -face interactions will never be replaced. Of course, it's great we're doing this over Zoom and the fact that our world has become pseudo, you know, Zoom hybrid. But the reality is, is that like, if you can really kind of show the hunger and hustle of getting in front of people face-to-face, -face, that's going to take it to another level, especially if you really know your stuff. Totally. I remember in college, my sophomore year, we had a fall break randomly in October and I convinced like two or three of my friends just to like hop in the car and drive to New York. So we drove from Duke. So it was like seven or eight hours. We like crashed on in his family home in Queens, the three of us on couches. And we set up meetings at like Morgan Stanley, Goldman, 
Morgan, Wells, like all the banks. We just set up coffee meetings all week. And that's how we spent our fall break. And, you know, having zero connections to Wall Street, absolutely knew no one in the industry. We went from that to all getting, you know, full-time banking offers. We all worked in private equity after that. And, yeah, you know, we're doing well. But if we hadn't done that trip, I don't know if we could have converted those offers. So sometimes you just have to make it work. Yeah. my One of my last internships at Northeastern was in Palo Alto. They pinged me saying like, hey, can you show up Sand Hill Road, Menlo Park for an interview? I was like 10, 15 minutes away. Fortuitous timing, right? But sometimes it's like, I knew I wanted to live in the Bay Area and I knew I wanted to focus on technology. So I was just like, all right, like any internship I can get out there, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live in San Francisco after school because it was the hub of tech. And that ended up like sometimes just being in the right place in the right time. Luck works in your favor, right? But you really have to like sometimes like optimize for it by frankly, I think like the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, well said, well said. Are there any other questions that come to mind? Otherwise, maybe we can discuss a little bit more around, well, in all honesty, off cycle or private equity recruiting is something that many individuals have been asking us about recently and been having the conversations around like, when might something start off? What does that look like? Not to mention, of course, as crazy as it sounds, kind of like 2024 recruiting out in the future. What I would say is that like part of it ends up being really with a lot of our mentees as well. Many individuals try to time the test and they really, really try to get an understanding of like, okay, like if this happens this date, like if I'm taking a test, the GMAT 180 days from now, I'm going to start preparing like 90 days before that just to align my timing appropriately. Now, if you were in school and like sometimes this worked in school, right? It was like, okay, like very, very succinct timelines, very specific. Maybe school was the only thing you were working on. So you didn't have work and you didn't have other responsibilities. But the reality is like when you're working in banking, when you're working in finance as a whole, like let's keep it real. Like you're working like what? 70, 80, 90, 100 hours plus there are 168 hours in the week. You're working a lot. So the reality is like life continuously gets in the way. We literally have mentees that have paid for coaching that have done some calls and then have just like disappeared MIA because they just got busy with work. So you really have to plan for this situation that ends up being like your full-time job a year, two years in advance while you're already working to the capacity of like a normal, like one and a half, two X human work style. And if you have any thoughts on that, I'll see. But the timing of the test, I think is, I think is tough, right? Because we get that quite a bit. 2024 is coming up. When should I start preparing for that? The reality is these days we don't know the timing. Headhunters don't know the timing. Sad to say people don't know the timing, right? You really have to go in with the angle of like, listen, I'm just going to start preparing sooner than later and see what happens. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people leave it up to chance and for some people it works out for most, it doesn't. Um, so, you know, why put yourself in that situation? I would just, if, if private equity is something you really want to do, it's become a pretty late stage industry, you know, it kind of started off in the eighties during the LBO boom, like KKR buying out RJR Nabisco and whatnot. You guys might've read, you know, that book barbarians at the gate, but now it's been like decades since then. And we know what they test. We know who the major firms are. It's no longer a black box. And like, we hope with office hours, we've kind of helped increase the transparency around that. We know pretty much exactly what they're going to ask you. So you should just study for it. There is a lead time for it. It's not easy. Like you definitely have to have some banking experience for private equity or, you know, some good finance knowledge. And then if you put in, I think probably 50 to hundred hours prep, however you want to spread it out, we think you can get a private equity job somewhere. And then, you know, if you want it to be at you know certain places, then maybe a little more time. So however you want to spread that out, if you want to do 50 hours in a week, I guess there's 168 hours in a week. I guess you can do it. It's going to be really tough. You know, if you, if you just did it your senior year of high school and get it done with, that's also cool too. You know, a lot of people take the GMAT during high school. The GMAT also takes 50 hours to study for if you want to try to break, you know, 720, 730. So, you know, we know what it takes now to get these jobs. It's going to take around 50 hours of effort. If you do it early, you'll be ready by the time recruiting starts. And if you don't do it, you might miss your window, but you might have off cycle opportunities like this year. And then for banking, I would say put a haircut on everything I just said. So, you know, if it's 50 to 100 hours for private equity, banking could be less from a technical preparation standpoint because you don't have a lot of deals you want to talk about. You're just going to break into the industry. It's going to be a lot more effort on the networking side, which has an even longer lead time. You know, you can't just email someone and hop on the phone the next day. It takes months, weeks for sure to cultivate relationships and get them comfortable enough with you to, you know, say, hey, oh, you know, we weren't interviewing two months ago, but we are now. And uh, I remember I talked to Tim and it was a great conversation. I want to put him in the running and see if he's still interested in interviewing. You know, that happens all the time and that's how you should approach networking. But it's a long lead time item. And I would say, you know, start networking yesterday. Yeah, honestly, I don't really even count networking as within that kind of like prep time because that's just building relationships, right? Like we've built a business here literally based on relationships. I couldn't tell you how many hours we put in to cultivating some of those relationships and as well as the new one. Figuring out what you want to do specifically, the strategy, the industry, the firm you want to work at. Sure, that's included in the curriculum, but the reality is that's like more like an innate question. That's more like introspective. I'm thinking about like what's interesting to me and why I want to pursue XYZ firm. Of course, the technicals, that does take time as 
as we've seen. And frankly, we have our curriculums that can help out with that, not to mention materials and coaching. But the reality is like, if this is something that you really want to do, it requires more than just kind of like the two plus two planning. A lot of the times we tend to think like, okay, like technically banking is two years, private equity might be two years, maybe go to business school. Sure. Maybe come back to private equity. That makes sense. If it works out that way, honestly, some of our coaches, these are some of our like top, top, top tier coaches will do technically banking, growth equity or private equity, go to business school, get business school paid for by that firm and then go back there as VPs. Now, how often does that happen? We're already talking about slim chances. This is like even slimmer, right? Like a percentage of the percentage. And the reality is that means that that first firm that you go to fresh out of banking, that has to be your one if that's what it's going to be, right? Technically, if you're going to go to business school, they're going to pay for it. You're going to come back as VP, basically get a bunch of carry that you're going to need to see over the next three, four, five years vesting. You're going to want to stay there. So honestly, like sometimes during banking, the firm that you choose, if you choose right, one, that's a big decision. And two, you can really end up staying there for some time and building a career. That's why we really optimize for multiple offers. It shouldn't just be one firm being like, okay, I got this offer. I should take it because I got an offer. It should be no, like you have a couple of different options to choose from. If you're really good at the interview process, you got multiple offers. Another note on that two plus two plus two, I think it's getting pretty outdated as a career track. I think it used to be kind of a very risk averse path that's been laid out in front of you. So it's easy to execute. But the reality is, you know, we, we ran the numbers. There's over 2000 PE associates in the US. Harvard Business School took 120 people from private equity into their class of a thousand. So 6% chance if you're in private equity already working at a job that's insanely hard to get. You know, if you look at the funnel of like millions of applicants for investment banking, there's probably 20,000 investment banking analysts in the US. So 10% of those people break into private equity at 2000. And then 6% of that can get into a Harvard, even less into Stanford because they don't really like the finance background as much as like a Wharton or a Harvard. So I would not rely on that path and nor nor do I think it's necessarily the best path to choose. We know people who have done that path and are doing well. You know, people who've done that path and definitely could have done it without the MBA or the private equity and just gone straight from banking. So I think they could have saved four or five years of their life. So I think it's super important to identify early on what it is that you're trying to do and just go do it and not waste too much time here because the world has so many options where you can make well into the six figures in your 20s. Doesn't have to be in finance, doesn't have to be in tech, but if you're more in that bucket where you don't know what you want to do, we can help with that too. Yes. And then sorry, I guess we have like one last question here. Devon had asked, do you think it'd be easier to rotate down to New York within banking or just as hard to go directly to private equity? So you're thinking potentially lateral or go direct to buy side. I think honestly, my two cents to that would be like, where have people gone from your group in the past? That might be like a good point to emulate and just kind of like think about if they've lateraled, if they've gone directly to buy side, at least you have like a network to call upon. Not to mention, it's not necessarily past performing dictates future results, but, but it does give you an understanding roughly. People have lateraled to other groups and then they've gone to private equity from there. Probably they've done it for a reason. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Asif. Yeah, just finishing thoughts here. We have a candidate we work with who's at a pretty nice mid-market bank, but he's in the Midwest. And he came to us like a year and a half ago saying like, I really, I really want to work in private equity. Uh, no one in my group has done it in the past five years. Or like maybe they've stayed in the Midwest for private equity. I want to go to New York. And he was a real sharp guy, worked really hard. He's been working with us, like, you know, doing calls every month for a year and a half and like prepping and doing investment pitches. And he ended up getting super days at like five of the best kind of shops out there in his field and, you know, converted one offer and is starting in New York. And every analyst in this group, every, even the associates came up to him and was like, how did you do that? Because you're the first person that's left our group in five years and made it to New York. So it's possible, but it's an uphill battle because again, it's the same thing with headhunters. It's like, why would I risk taking a chance on this Canadian applicant when we have like literally thousands of investment bankers in New York to choose from who can show up to this interview in like a 30 minutes notice, which by the way, that's how OnCycle works. They'll just give you a like 30 minutes, one hour heads up and say, hey, can you be at Blackstone's office at seven o'clock today? And you're like, oh, it's 6 p.m. I guess I'm in Midtown. I guess I can make it, you know, to Blackstone. The guys in financial district at Goldman are probably like, oh my God, I hope I beat rush hour traffic and get up to Midtown in time. If you're in Canada, like no shot, no shot you make that 7 p.m. meeting. So a lot of people during on cycle will book a ticket to New York and find an excuse to be there, pay for it out of pocket just so they can interview. But you know, it, it, it is tough. So I think if your goal is to break into New York private equity, being at a New York bank is definitely an advantage. But for reasons we talked about earlier, there are ways around it where you can get in directly from Canada. It's just, you have to put in the prerequisite networking work and um, you'll have an idea of whether you have a good relationship with that person or not come interview time and whether they're willing to pull you in or not. Any questions you have, feel free to email us, rohit at getofficehours.com, asif at getofficehours.com. Apologies that we're going to have to cut it off right now with time, but thank you for joining. And we want to look to do this a bit more often as well and loop in other individuals from there for their perspectives. So yes, thank you very much for being here. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Appreciate the time. Take care.